Hey, how's it going, everybody? My name is Brandon, and today I want to talk to you about curb roasting. Now, the way we're going to do this is we'll go through a general overview of what curb roasting is, then we'll go through and set it up in our lab, and finally, we'll go ahead and exploit curb roasting in our lab environment. But before we get into that, I do want to say, if you are currently not subscribed to my channel, make sure you go down below and click that subscribe button. I'm going to be coming out with a lot of awesome content pretty soon, and also I'm doing the lab live stream series, which you definitely do not want to miss out on. With that being said, let's go ahead and jump into talking about uh, how curb roasting actually works. So to do that, we need to understand what a service principal name is in Kerberos or an SPN. Now, essentially, according to Microsoft, the way to you know describe this is that uh, SPNs are used to associate a service instance with a service logon account. Now, what this means is that you could have a service running on some machine in your domain and that the SPN is kind of a way to act as a pointer to the uh, actual domain account which is running that service. So that way, when something wants to request access to that service, it doesn't need to know what the actual domain account is that's running the service. It just knows I want access to, you know, service X on machine Y, you know, give me access to that, right? So let's look at an example of what the format of an SPN would look like. So what this is gonna be is it's gonna be the service name at first. So for example, we could have MS SQL service. And then it's going to be a slash and then the machine name. So for example, it could be the machine name SQL one, and then we're going to do an at, and it's going to be the Kerberos realm name or your active directory domain name. So, uh, for our example, it's going to be conda.local and optionally you could put a port here as well. Uh, but that's not, that's not necessary. So this is an example SPN. So if something were to request access to this SPN, it would be requesting access to this MySQL service, which is running on this machine in this domain but this microsoft sql service could be running as you know an account that's called like sql service 0004 at conda.local which could be just a regular domain uh, user or service account but something that's requesting access to it doesn't need to know that it's called sql service account 0004 at conda.local it just needs to know that i want access to this service at this machine in this domain so hopefully that clarifies what spns are used for in kerberos and how that works now let's go ahead and take a look at uh, a diagram that shows the authentication flow in Kerberos and how that authentication process works, because this is something that we're going to be taking advantage of in order to perform Kerberosing. Now it's important to note that Kerberosing isn't necessarily an exploit. It's an intended feature of how Kerberos works, but there is a way for us to abuse this uh, or for attackers to abuse this. Now, it does require that we have access to the domain, uh, either running commands as a user in the domain, uh, or we could be running this remotely from a different machine as long as we have some sort of credentials to the domain. They don't need to be privileged credentials at all, but just some you know, random user account or something like that on the domain would be required to run this attack remotely. Now, if you haven't seen my video on ASREP roasting, I highly recommend you go ahead and check that out. There'll be a little card popping up now. I talked a bit about more of the Kerberos authentication process, especially this ASREC and ASREP process right here. But we're going to be assuming that we've already gone through that process because we already have the valid domain account, so we can already do that and request our ticket granting ticket. Now, with Kerberosing, we're going to be focusing on this TGS REC and TGS REP. Now, when we perform this in Kerberos, we can request a ticket granting service for any account that has an SPN tied to it. So we can go ahead with a valid domain account, make this TGS rec for any account that has an SPN, and we will get in return this TGS rep or this ticket granting service reply. Now, this is going to be encrypted with the NTLM hash of the actual domain account that this service is running as. So that is important because what we can do is we can take that TGS rep and then we can extract the NTLM hash from that TGS rep and go ahead and crack that offline. So since we can just make this request, this TGS rec, and we'll get that TGS rep in return, which is encrypted with the NTLM hash of that domain account, we can go ahead and crack this offline. And this can lead to lateral movement or privilege escalation because a lot of these service accounts that you'll see out in the wild will be misconfigured, right? It's not uncommon to see companies that have service accounts that are running as domain admins, and they certainly shouldn't be because these service accounts are more than likely going to have an SPN tied to them, which means any user in the domain can essentially request the hash for that user's account, which is a big security problem. And that's why, you know, we're going to be talking about it and going through curb roasting because it's a huge problem and there's no real way 
to completely mitigate this. We'll talk a bit about the end of some best practices to use, but there's no real way to completely mitigate this because it's part of the Kerberos authentication process. Now let's go ahead and jump over into our lab. If you haven't been keeping up with the lab live stream series, I've only done one episode so far. There'll be a little card popping up for that as well, but I highly recommend that you jump on board and watch those live streams. It's been a lot of fun and uh, we're actually gonna be working in that lab that we've been developing so far. Let's go ahead and log into our domain controller here. So let's get logged in. Now we need to go ahead and just add a new user. So let's go over to tools and then, uh, where is it? Uh, let's see, Active Directory users and computers, perfect. Now I'm gonna go into this global users OU that we have, and let's just go ahead and add a new user. So let's just create this as like a, a SQL service account, we'll say. So we'll just say this is gonna be MSSQL underscore SVC, right? And then we can also just go ahead and we'll put this in the first name field, that's fine. And then just hit next. Now let's also go ahead and set a password for this. I'm just gonna use password one, two, three. It's a very secure password. Um, let's see, perfect. So we can go ahead and set that password there and hit finish. Now, this is just a standard domain account, but we need to go ahead and actually tie an SPN to this account so that it can be used as a service account. And we can actually request that uh, you know TGS for the SPN and crack it offline and go through the curb roasting process. So let's go ahead over to view here and we'll check in advanced features. You need to make sure that you have that checked in order to see the attribute editor. Now let's go back to our global users, our MS SQL service user, right click and go to properties. Now see there's this attribute editor tab here and we go ahead and click that. And what we're looking for here is service principal name. So we can actually go ahead and set the SPN like we were just talking about. So right here we can see service principal name, if we double click on that, we can see we can go ahead and add a service principal name. So for example, let's just do MSSQL um, SVC, and then we'll do slash DC1, which is the name of the domain control that we're on right now, at conda.local. Now for all intents and purposes of this exercise, it doesn't really matter what the SPN is, but we just need to go ahead and add some SPN to this account. Let's go ahead and hit add and then okay. Now if we hit apply and okay, that SPN should be set. Now, just for fun, let's right click on MS SQL service and let's add them to a group. Let's add them to the administrators group. So uh, this is gonna be our uh, administrators, perfect. We can go ahead and hit okay, perfect. So now they are an administrative user, uh, which is simulating a misconfigured service account. So now everything should be all ready. Let's go ahead and jump over into our Kali machine and take a look at how we can exploit this. So we're gonna be using a script from the Impacket repository. If you haven't seen that, I'll drop a link below down in the description. Impacket is something that's super useful and I wouldn't be surprised if you've come across it already. It does come pre-installed with Kali. So we can do impacket dash get users SPN. So get users SPNs, perfect. Now this script is gonna go ahead and actually find the SPNs of user accounts on the domain by default. So the syntax of this, we do get users SPN, and then we're gonna specify the domain controller IP, which we'll, we'll just say is DC-IP, and then the IP address of our domain controller, which is 192.168.9.174. Sorry, this is already showing up because I've ran this command before and I didn't know that the new version of Kali was doing that. I think it's because of the new shell that you, they're using, but it seems pretty cool. Uh, and then the next thing that we need to specify is actually the domain username that we know the credentials of. So this is not what we're trying to curb roast. This is just an account that we have the credentials for. Now you can get around this if you're running it directly on the machine that you wanna curb roast from. Um, so you can use things like, um, I believe PowerView has some capabilities due to curb roasting, or there's all sorts of other tools you can do uh, that you can use to do curb roasting. But for us to do it remotely, we do need some valid uh, credentials for a user account. So for us, we'll just use conda.local and then slash, you know, for example, we know John Smith's password. That's gonna say, we'll say that's the account that we've compromised. So we'll do john.smith and then that's it. We can just go ahead and hit enter. Now we're gonna need to enter John Smith's password again, because we do need control of some low level user account. John Smith, he's just a, you know, a regular user in this domain, no special privileges. But we can see the accounts that do have an SPN tied to them in the domain. And we see that we have this MS SQL service at DC1, Local SPN tied to this account name and we can see that they are a member of administrators for example so if we want to go ahead and actually uh, perform that you know tgs request request and get that tgs reply with uh the hash involved what we can do is just hit up and we'll just append this dash request onto here now this is going to go through and actually perform 
that Kerberos authentication process and try to get us the hash back for us to crack. So if we hit enter, again, it's gonna prompt us for John Smith's password. Go ahead and enter that. And we can see the response that we get back is the same as before. For this part, we can see the SPN that's tied to this account, but we also get this hash back. So what we can do is we'll just copy this and we'll go ahead and hit copy. Let's put this into a file. We'll just call it hash.txt. Go ahead and paste that in. And now we can actually go ahead and crack this offline with Hashcat or John or whatever your uh, password cracking tool of choice is. So you can see how this can be really dangerous because if somebody gets onto a domain once and there are Kerberosable accounts, which there you know, most likely is going to be, they can extract those hashes and then that's it. That's the only network footprint they need to have. Once they have the hashes, they can crack them offline. And as long as those passwords don't get changed, they will have access back into the network. So it's a you know way that attackers can establish persistence as well as lateral movement and privilege escalation. So if we want to crack this with Hashcat, let's see, if we just do Hashcat uh, dash dash help and then grep E type, let me see. I don't remember exactly what the, um, let's see. Oh, we need to add grep in there. Perfect. So what we're looking for is Kerberos 5 E-Type 23. So that's uh, Hashcat. The code for that is 13100. Awesome. So what we'll do is Hashcat-M13100-A0 for uh, dictionary attack. We'll specify hash.txt. Sorry, I'm getting all mixed up with this like autocomplete going. We'll specify hash.txt for what we want to actually crack. And then I have a special you know word list that we created. You could run this against any word list that you want. But for demonstration purposes, I just uh, have this word list.txt, which contains the actual password, which we know already is password123. And then we'll just append dash dash force and hit enter. Now it should go through and this will go ahead and crack that hash. Now I already have it cracked and you can see there's only one word, one word in that word list, but you can see this hash has been correlated to password one, two, three. So now we can go through and gain remote access as this user and get back into the system. So that's how we can go through and actually perform this curb roasting attack on a domain account, which has an SPN tied to it. So this is something you should definitely keep a, an eye out for in your domains. The best mitigation strategy that I have seen is to make sure that you have very long and complex passwords for all of your accounts, which has SPNs tied to them. And also make sure those passwords are rotated very often and make sure that your service accounts have the least amount of privilege possible. You don't want to be putting those accounts in your domain admins group or things like that because they are going to be vulnerable to Kerberosing, you know, because that is part of the Kerberos authentication protocol. It's an intended way for this to work. Um, accounts need to be able to request access to different things that are tied via SPNs. So you need to make sure that you have strong passwords and limited access on those service accounts. Hopefully this video helped to clarify how curb roasting works. I'd encourage you to go into your lab and test setting this up and replicating the attack so you get a better understanding of how it works. I think it's always better to get that hands-on experience. If you found the video useful, please remember to like and subscribe down below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.